Okay, uh, welcome everyone. It is a, an absolutely gorgeous day here in Virginia. A great day to get out on uh, trail if you have uh, the uh, option to get out there. Um, I am pleased to uh, welcome you to this, uh, this meeting, seminar, workshop, whatever you wanna call it, um, where we're gonna talk about uh, measure, how to measure the impact of trails. And I'm pleased to welcome our uh, consultant. Uh, his name is Kevin Williams. He is from BBC Research and Consulting. Um, Kevin is uh, a uh, researcher on social studies and diversity research and disparity studies. Um, he supports a wide range of clients around the country and brings a variety of quantitative and qualitative skills. Um, and he has a uh, master's degree from the LBGJ School of Public Affairs at University of Texas at Austin. Um, we are uh, pleased to welcome him here from Denver, Colorado. Uh, where I hope it, the weather is as nice as, as it is here today. Thank you, Corey. Uh, yeah, it's fairly nice today. We had a wave of 100, 100 plus degree heat last week, but it's cooled down a little bit, so that's nice. Great. Um, thank you all for, for attending. Um, <clears throat> and thank you to NBRC for hosting and setting up all the technical, technical, um, infrastructure to, to allow us to, to have this meeting. I wanted to um, start off, uh, give a brief overview of what we'll be talking about. Um, we're gonna have some introductions. We have a small enough group that I feel like we can um, be fairly informal. I have a pretty substantial presentation. We'll be sending a copy of it out afterwards. It has links to um, some of the studies that we'll be discussing. Um, but I definitely want to uh, hear, you know, who's here from various organizations and what your interests are in um, trail impact studies. We are also going to uh, kind of uh, do an overview of uh, trail, biking, and walking impact studies that have um, taken place over the last decade or so across the country. There's been a number of studies. It's helpful to kind of look at what, um, what common themes we see from those studies, what methods are used, and, uh, you know, understand what, um, how that relates to what we'll be doing for um, the Potomac Heritage National Scenic Trail. So we're going to talk about dimensions of analysis, um, health impacts, uh, social and equity analyses, economic impacts. Um, and then we'll also talk about a couple of recent regional studies and just provide some context and, and highlight there's some uh, really good regional studies out there. And I think that um, if you are uh, a practitioner in this space, uh, they can be helpful for um, talking to key stakeholders and policymakers about uh, the importance of trails. And then we will be talking about the Potomac Heritage National Scenic T Trail study that we are embarking on um, in, in terms of the goals for the study, what methodology we'll be using. Um, uh, one of the key aspects of this study is that we'll be looking at the impacts of closing a few of the gaps in the trail. And so um, it'll be interesting to have a bit of discussion about that. And then, um, you know, throughout and at the end, I want to make sure that we have time for questions and comments. Um, although if you were anything like me and you, you have uh, questions later on, you know, bolt awake in the middle of the night and have additional questions, um, feel free to reach out when I send the presentation out. I'll make sure that my uh, email and contact information is provided. Um, we'll also be talking about the next steps for this particular study and when you might expect to see some results. So uh, it's exciting. 
So in terms of introduction, I know we have a number of uh, NVRC folks here and uh, Corey, if you wouldn't mind walking through the folks that are here from NVRC and uh, giving them a chance to introduce themselves and, and what role they play, that would be great. Absolutely. Uh, my name is Corey Miles. I'm a environmental planner for the Northern Virginia Regional Commission. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with NVRC, we are a regional um, council of 14 jurisdictions in Northern Virginia. Uh, we are managed by a, a board of elected officials. Uh, and our primary duty is to facilitate collaboration and, and coordination on, on regional issues. So that's a variety of things, um, it, one of which is uh, trails, um, regional trails being one, um, and, and the Potomac Heritage National Scenic Trail. And we do this with support from the National Park Service. And uh, we also have Debbie Speliotopoulos on from NVRC. You want to just unmute and say hi? Hi, everybody. And uh, we also have uh, Jill Kana. Is Jill here? Hello, everyone. I am Jill Kana, and my role on this project is to manage the data and analysis and the mapping. I am the demographer and GIS manager for Northern Virginia Regional Commission. Great, um, and then I guess we can go to the National Park Service. Next, Ann. Sure, hi everyone. My name, I'm not sure if my video is working. Uh, no, it's not. So but I am the acting superintendent for the Potomac Heritage National Scenic Trail. And um, normally I'm in, in the National Capital Regional Office at Haynes Point in Washington, DC. Glad to be here. Great. And uh, do we have anybody else from NPS on? No, I don't think so. Um, and then we have a number of our guests today. Uh, and I think what I'm going to do is just do a roll call. If you don't mind, just um, when I call your name, uh, there's only 12 of us. So when I call your name, just go ahead and, and introduce yourself and, and just kind of give a brief introduction of uh, why you're here. And I'm doing this in alphabetical order. So Becky Blanchard, you are first. You should have the ability to unmute. There hey, you I'm so sorry, having some technical difficulties, um, just getting myself unmuted. Hopefully you can hear me. This is Becky Blanchard. I am the trail administrator for the Pacific Northwest National Scenic Trail. I work for the Forest Service and sit in Portland, Oregon, and I'm really excited to um, see how our fellow National Scenic Trail um, is approaching this topic. Thanks. All right, Karina. Karina Velasquez Mondragon, please. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I side camera over here. Um, my name is Karina Velasquez. I am the Visitor Services Specialist at the Potomac River National Wildlife Refuge Complex. We have three locations, uh, refuges, um, one in Lorton at Mesa Neck, and then uh, two in Woodridge, Occoquan and Featherstone. Smith. Hi everyone, I'm glad to be here. I'm from Prince William County Community Services and uh, we are just looking for um, some information on how we can really leverage a lot of our trail systems in the county and um, use some of this data to kind of build a nice foundation for some more collaborative partnerships in the future. So uh, thanks for having us on and we're looking forward to hearing your presentation. 
Jefferson Miller. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jefferson Miller. I'm a park planner with Loudoun County Department of Parks, Recreation and Community Services. And I'm just looking forward to, to learning more about this topic. Thank you for doing this. Excellent. Uh, Jennifer Wampler. Jennifer Wampler here. I'm the Trails Coordinator with the Virginia Department of Conservation and Recreation. And I'm really grateful to the Northern Virginia Regional Commission for doing this study because I think it's going to provide some new information that really helps advance our state trail network. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, Mark Novak. Good afternoon, everybody. Mark Novak, Chief Park Planner with Loudoun County Parks, Recreation, and Community Services. Um, also uh, lead for the uh, Potomac Harris National Scenic Trail in Loudoun. And um, looking forward to learning a little more about this uh, topic. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Naomi Fireman. Hi there, um, this is Naomi. I work with Karina at the Potomac River uh, National Wildlife Refuge Complex doing transportation projects. Uh, and I'm just, you know, listening in to hear about the results from the study and uh, yeah, thank you. All right, thanks. I, I'm, I'm, I have W, L, and Day. I'm not sure if the W is supposed to be in the front or in the back, but that's what, <laughs> that's what it says. So please. Yeah, I'm Alan Day and I'm the Potomac Heritage, uh, uh, Potomac Appalachian Trail Club, uh, co-district manager for the Potomac Heritage Trail. And <clears throat> I'm also district manager for Wolf Trap National Park for the Performing Arts Trail. And I've per participated in the uh, Virginia State Trails Advisory Committee meetings. Hi, Jennifer. Glad to see you. <laughs> I love that background. <laughs> all right, I guess, um, did I forget anyone or is that, a, that's all I have on my list that I can see here. That's all I see as well. Okay, all right, all let's right. get on with it. All right, uh, and uh, Corey already gave me a great introduction. My name is Kevin Williams. I'm with BBC Research and Consulting. We're out of Denver. We do a wide variety of uh, economic and policy research across the country, including a number of economic impact studies related to trails, recreation, transportation, and active transportation. So um, we're going to walk through a bit of uh, how, how we think about um, these types of analyses. And uh, you know, there's a number of dimensions that you can think of for an analysis of this type. Um, you know, there's geographies, various geographies that the, uh, uh, the study can encompass, ranging from um, a small segment, a few blocks of uh, infrastructure development, all the way to, um, we've seen national studies of uh, kind of recreation and recreation impacts. Um, we also want to understand a little bit about what activities we look at. So for the Potomac Heritage Trail, uh, when NVRC was putting together their requests, they were they were um, um, they wanted to be pretty broad in terms of you know looking at hiking, walking, running, biking, as well as the water trail aspects of the Potomac Heritage National Scenic Trail in Northern Virginia. In addition, there's a number of uh, impact categories that you can look across. Uh, so health impacts, equity impacts, economic impacts. Um, uh, and within those, there are a number of different choices that, that each of each study can make about um, which impacts are important for communicating whatever your message is about, about trails. And then there's also a timeline. And one of the things that we'll see in a few of these studies um, that we'll talk about both nationally and regionally is that some studies include construction costs, some studies look at sort of annual steady state, um, you know, uh, participation by residents and what activity that, that encompasses. And other studies look across a broad, you know, maybe the lifetime of, of an asset if you're investing in, in a trail. 
for instance. So um, I would also encourage you all to, uh, you know, given the size of the group, um, as questions come up, feel free to unmute and, um, you know, sh sh shout it out, if you will, or you can put a question in the chat or you can raise your hand. There's a lot of ways to get my attention and I, and I wanna make sure that we are addressing um, you know, questions and topics that you all have. So when we think about uh, the geography of trail, we kind of think of four categories. Um, and there's one of these that's a bit different than geography, but you know, the first one is kind of a segment of a trail or a segment of a, of a recreational facility or a specific event. Um, oftentimes there's, you know, with a segment, there might be a before and after study. Um, there's typically you wanna have data about that particular segment. Uh, and that can range from um, counts to surveys, uh, registrations in the case of an event. Um, they're typically useful in justifying the type of investment that's, uh, that's been done in that case or in attracting a new event to a particular region. And, and I think one of the things that's important here, um, you know, over the last 15 years or so, we've seen a lot of evolution of um, especially health and economic impact analyses for trails and recreation. And occasionally we've seen sort of um, survey results from a segment Kind of broadened to, you know, in the in the most uh, egregious, if you will, example, there was a survey that was done about a particular trailhead and what proportion of the users were from out of state, and then they just used that proportion across the entire state. Now that was the best data they had at the time, but um, I think it's important to understand that, you know, using data from from one study or another, you need to make sure that you understand how those data were collected and what caveats that might come with. Uh, the next level up of geography is kind of a corridor where, um, you know, maybe there's a investment, a substantial investment, and so you can look at construction benefits for a particular section. Um, you know, granular data can be very useful, but it's not necessarily required. There's uh, oftentimes you can apply some regional survey information or information about activity um, for a broader geography instead of having to really drill down. And, it, it, and you know, a corridor study such as this one is, is useful for um, kind of encouraging regional collaboration. Um, many of the trails that are out there uh, across the country are, um, you know, put together by groups of individuals that cross numerous different organizations, numerous different jurisdictions, and have to kind of navigate how you, uh, you know, have a cohesive sense of what a, a corridor trail is, and also, um, you know, allow for the individual jurisdictions to make decisions for their own particular portion of that. In terms of, uh, uh, regions, um, you know, we have looked at regional investments and tried to understand what the impact of, kind of a network of trails might be or network of active transportation infrastructure. Um, we've often seen that it's, it's helpful to do resident surveys uh, so that you can have a specific understanding of residents in the region. Uh, a drawback to that is that they can be quite expensive to do resident surveys. Um, and it, it often helps highlight kind of overall funding strategies that might be taken to a uh, you know state or national funding board or something like that. And then for, for state level uh, analyses, um, we've seen a number of state level uh, economic and health impact studies. Um, it's great to do state work because there's often a lot of data available at the same time um, you know, you end up with this kind of average of what's going on across an entire uh, entire area like the state of Michigan, for, in, for instance, and, and it, um, it may not help make a local case for investment as easily. Uh, in most state studies, resident surveys are, are almost a requirement or at least leaning on surveys that have been done with state residents. Um, and you can also do some pretty specific focuses. We've had 
I've seen some state studies that look specifically at like bike packing within a state or something like that. And that's definitely feasible. Whereas on a region or corridor or segment level, that kind of analysis might be difficult. In terms of the activities, uh, you know, we have uh, looked at well over 200 studies uh, from the last 20 years on uh, trail, transportation, and recreation. Um, many of those are in, you know, biking, walking. We've also seen uh, a prevalence recently in water trails. Um, and then we're also starting to see, uh, you know, cross-country ski trails or hut trip trail economic impacts or snowmobiling trail economic impacts. Many of, many of these studies, uh, you can look at the same um, types of benefits, you know, health, transportation, um, tourism, retail spending. Um, in some of them, there are some unique aspects that you can, can analyze, you know, in bicycling, there's um, manufacturing, and, and that's particularly important in certain communities where there's large bike manufacturers. Um, you know, in other places, uh, you know, with the, the, the water trails, understanding the impacts of the environmental and water quality of, of the water body on the, the trail and tourism can be important. So there's a number of reasons that you can, you can want to do a study. You know, you obviously to encourage additional investment to document uh, who is using the trail and who's benefiting, benefiting from it. And that uh, we see uh, repeatedly when this question isn't ignored, when, when people actually look into the question of equity and trail use, that there are uh, substantial inequities. Um, and so these studies can be helpful in um, helping our industry and, and trails and, and recreation in general um, see those blind spots. Um, you know, questions that we like to ask when we're starting a study are, you know, who is the audience that this study is for? And, and often it can be fairly broad. You know, we want to tell everybody about how great our, our trail or our segment or act, this particular activity in this area are. But um, it's helpful to really understand, like, who are the top, you know, primary folks. Um, we have seen studies where, you know, it's, really about trying to get legislators to dedicate more money, or it's really about helping residents and businesses understand that uh, these kind of investments will be helpful to their, um, to the long-term health of their communities, um, those sorts of things, and, and trying to understand what action you would like to come out of the study. And then there's a, there's a real balance between um, effort and, and resources and the quality of the study. Um, there are, uh, you know, you can do what we call in economics research, benefits transfer research, where you say, gosh, this study over here identified a benefit. We think that the uh, trail and users and activities that they're studying are similar enough that we're just going to apply it over here to our trail. Um, and I think that that is helpful in many cases, and but it has to be done uh, with care. And I think that there is a direct correlation between folks um, you know, believing what comes out of a study and how specific the data are to where you're looking at. So uh, at the same time, um, we have done a number of studies and they've ranged substantially in budget and the, the higher budget ones, um, you're able to do resident surveys, telephone surveys, um, you know, in-depth interviews with business owners and those sorts of things and really add depth to the study. But we know that sometimes that just isn't feasible with, um, with budgets. So that's something to think about. Um, and I'll try to point out in, in these uh, national examples, some places where, you know, uh, studies have used kind of benefits transfer or some places where they've really put in the time and effort and tried to, um, you know, go in depth uh, on, on their specific area. When we look at um, the health benefits, uh, you know, 
we know that there are benefits to residents from physical activity. Uh, we look at those in terms of reduced mortality. That means the increased lifespan due to physical activity, reduced morbidity, so uh, fewer uh, folks coming down with particular diseases or less incidence of that disease due to physical activity. Uh, we know that there are environmental and awareness and mental health uh, benefits from trails. And um, we know that reducing, you know, on the side of transportation, so, you know, physical activity can be for recreation, for transportation, um, but on the side of transportation in specific, we know that uh, replacing motorized trips with either walking, hiking, running, or biking uh, has environmental benefits related to reduced emissions. Um, here's an example of the mortality benefits uh, and how we look at it uh, with the World Health Organization's heat model. So the heat model was developed by the World Health Organization to understand um, and bring together research that showed that when a community as a whole has increased physical activity, their, uh, their lifespan goes up. And how do you value that? Um, and the way that the heat model works is you take an annual amount of biking or walking uh, in terms of miles and minutes for a particular area. Uh, you know, in the case of the Potomac Heritage National Scenic Trail in Northern Virginia, one of the things that we're going to be attempting to do is gather those data, who is using the trail and how much across the corridor on an annual basis. And then you look at the difference in the mortality rates uh, due to physical activity. Um, the, overall, uh, the overall all ages mortality rate for the region that you're looking at. So in this case, we might uh, lean on Virginia Department of Health data. And then um, you apply what's called the value of statistical life, where uh, organizations across the world have looked at what are residents willing to pay uh, in order to increase safety or increase uh, health outcomes in their communities uh, to get an extra year of life. Um, this is a number that, that when we do studies in the U.S., we rely on the U.S. Department of Transportation's calculations. They update this number on a regular basis, publish peer-reviewed papers on it. So that's what we pull in. It's also what USDOT uses for um, understanding the value of safety improvements, particularly on highway investments. And out of this comes an overall impact uh, of the trail or, or the activity. Um, there's some notes on the, on the heat model that are important to understand. Um, you know, because there are a few studies that have looked at, uh, you know, folks that are really active, so much more than the kind of 30 minutes a day, five days a week, um, they have capped the benefits that you see for, uh, you know, individual users at the, the high end of the spectrum. Um, the model is calibrated for adults, 20 to 74. It's meant for kind of a general population analysis, not uh, looking at uh, an individual or for uh, a really unique population that might vary from the regional data that you have. And it's, it's meant to be taken in kind of order of magnitude estimates. In terms of avoided healthcare costs, so again, this is looking as opposed to mortality at morbidity. Um, one, of the, one of the ways that we, we do that and that we've seen in studies is to identify uh, a number of chronic conditions that where we know that their incidence and their severity is um, impacted by physical activity. So being physically active uh, lessens the potential healthcare costs. And then uh, we look at the incident rates of those specific conditions in the region, uh, as well as treatment costs. Again, with um, the Potomac Heritage Trail, we will likely be relying on uh, Virginia Department of Health information about that. Um, and then we look at the number of active users. So uh, who is getting their required exercise uh, from, in this case, uh, the PHNST, and uh, based on the incidence rate in the communities, how many cases are we avoiding? And then we use the treatment costs to kind of multiply through those proportions and look at an annual benefit from recreation, 
transportation and physical activity in a particular area. In terms of the environmental benefits from, from health, um, again, these are looking at emissions for uh, transportation use. So what trips is a particular network or trail or region or placing that would be typically car trips? Uh, what are the VMT, the vehicle miles traveled, replaced by those? Um, what would the typical emissions be for vehicles in that region? And then um, there are pretty standard cost estimates that come out of uh, EPA and NEPA processes for you know, how do you value um, reductions in pollution for uh, carbon emissions or uh, NOx emissions, those, those sorts of things. When we look at social and equity analyses, uh, one of the things that we often often see and has been an increasing area of research across the past few years is uh, documenting that benefits are experienced disproportionately by privileged populations. Uh, we know that recreational activities can have a cost of entry. We know that infrastructure investments such as trails are frequently funded by property taxes or special districts, um, which tend to have more resources in uh, more affluent communities. We also know that traffic violence uh, the, the cost of traffic violence falls disproportionately on underserved communities. Uh, and that, um, you know, it's important to understand that gender, racial, and ethnic disparities often indicate, uh, you know, a flaw in the current infrastructure or programs. Uh, one of the things that we've seen a number of times over the past uh, decade is that when, uh, for instance, in in the case of protected bike infrastructure, when you install protected bike infrastructure, you see um, uh, the gender ratio of cyclists become more even. Whereas if you don't have protected bike infrastructure, uh, the bicycling population in a particular area tends to skew male. Um, you know, when we look at these impacts, we will often think about this in terms of the disparities. So what are the key metrics that we want to understand about trail participation? Maybe it's the overall participation rate or the overall miles used or um, certain safety statistics or where the access points are. And you look at those data um, where you can by demographic, uh, demographic characteristics, uh, race, ethnicity, uh, gender, um, income levels. And then you look at the net differences, but you also look at the ratios. Uh, so one of the things that we know is that understanding, you know, what proportion of, uh, you know, higher income folks have access to trails and parks versus uh, lower income and understanding that in terms of uh, the ratio in, in terms of access is important, especially because you know, in terms of demographics, there's there's variety of, um, you know, in most communities, there's um, maybe a larger share of, of uh, white folks in a certain community. And so just looking at the raw percentages may not get the full story across. Uh, we also think it's important to document those sources of barriers that you come across in terms of equity. Is it investment? Is it uh, folks not having uh, a comfort level with the particular activity or uh, infrastructure that's being installed. Um, are there uh, ways to overcome that that can be recommended for, for future investments? In terms of economic measures, uh, there are a variety of economic measures that, that folks use for understanding trails and recreational and, and active transportation um, investments, uh, jobs and employment, obviously. Um, this is particularly important when you're thinking about construction costs. Uh, there are indirect and induced impacts. So if there's spending in a particular area, how do those dollars circulate within the community? For example, if you uh, um, are a trail user, you stop at a restaurant and um, buy a meal, some of that money stays within the economy to purchase supplies, to pay the wages of the folks that are preparing and serving the meals. And so how does that circulation happening? 
And then of course, tourism development, a number of folks see that there are benefits to having these types of amenities for uh, attracting folks that are on vacation. If there's an opportunity to go to a, a place that, that makes it easy to get around in, a, um, in an active manner, um, that will attract more tourists. Uh, we also have looked at property value increases due to trail investment. I think that that's, uh, that's something that we'll be talking about a little bit, but it's also important to consider that with respect to the conversation about equity. Um, we know that one of the challenges facing many communities across the country is gentrification and how does infrastructure investment, um, what role does it play in gentrification and property values? You know, I think that you know, 15, 20 years ago, folks were like, oh, it increased, trails can increase property values. That's a really great thing. And now there's some question about, you know, okay, if we are putting this infrastructure in and increasing those property values, uh, what obligation do we have to understand how that impacts displacement? Um, and then there's also community fiscal benefits. So with any economic activity, you can uh, understand that there might be sales tax implications or um, you know, other, other government uh, funding that, that is benefits from the trail activity. A brief example of kind of a logic model for economic measures, you know, if you're looking at retail spending or a tourism impact, you could determine uh, the overall uh, trail usage by a particular set of folks. For instance, in, in with tourism, you might only count folks outside of a certain um, subset of counties, or maybe it's folks that are out of state. Uh, you look at a, what a typical spending profile is, either capture that through an intercept survey or uh, sometimes the uh, local chambers of commerce or organizations like AAA have that information on a daily spending profile for out of area tourists. You look at the local business capture rate. So uh, is this spending, you know, if we know that folks are spending on um, snacks for their trips, uh, what proportion are they buying beforehand and what proportion are they buying during the trip? And then you can uh, model those secondary, uh, where secondary impacts where um, they're flowing through uh, the economy and the fiscal impacts at, as appropriate. In terms of property values, this is an example of a property value model that we did that I'll talk about a little bit later on. But um, there are techniques where if you have the data and the time, you can look at uh, you know, how do trails influence uh, housing values. In this particular instance, uh, we wanted to make sure that we were controlling for uh, other factors that influence housing price, parcel size, uh, the amount of living space, the number of bedrooms and bathrooms. Uh, when a particular sale took place, um, the school district and the age of the structure and in this case, uh, we did find that there was a positive impact for uh, trail, uh, trail impacts. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, again, this is a pretty interesting um, type of study to do, but it is, does take a lot of time and effort. So I'm gonna walk through a couple of, uh, uh, more than a couple, a few examples of trail studies. Um, in the PowerPoint, in the notes field, when we send it out, uh, there will be links to each of these studies. And I'm just trying to give an overview of, you know, these are the types of studies that have been done. Here's the information that's out there and, and they might be useful for you to, to think about. Um, you know, in terms of a segment analysis, um, you know, the, Portland has a lot of, of bicycle and walking infrastructure. Uh, recently, they've been looking at what's called the Portland Green Loop, and uh, they looked at property values and how they would expect property values to change based on implementation of the loop. Uh, one interesting thing was that the increase in property values was greater for multifamily homes. I think that there's a, um, there's a potential causal understanding of that where, um, you know, having access to recreational opportunities if you're in a single family home may not be quite as valuable 
as if you're in a multifamily complex where you may not have a yard or something like that. Um, there was an increase in retail sales tax in the area. Uh, again, this map shows the um, where the property values were, but my recollection is that the, the sales tax followed that as well. And then, you know, this is a study where they documented the jobs created due to construction and implementation of the Greenway. Um, a side note about looking at the, the construction jobs, one of the things that's interesting is that, uh, you know, almost any infrastructure activity will have uh, a jobs impact. Uh, when we look at trails, oftentimes more of that impact is captured locally um, because there aren't as many complex elements to the infrastructure investment. Uh, for instance, building a trail like the Portland Green Loop is uh, technologically less challenging than building, uh, for instance, the um, uh, the Alaskan Viaduct uh, bypass in Seattle where they tunneled under Seattle. Uh, and so even if you have a construction project, um, oftentimes with the trail impacts um, because more local firms can participate, those benefits are captured locally. Another segment study was uh, done uh, by a University of Denver uh, planning student just down the road from us. Uh, and it, it's interesting because I think that this shows how uh, studies build on each other. Um, this segment study built on the methodology used uh, in, a, in a study that we'll talk about in the regional section from New York. And uh, what this study was, was understanding individual segments uh, of bike infrastructure and how that influenced um, like the, the sales tax revenues. So uh, what this, this student, Stephen Riho did is chose four corridors that were fairly similar in terms of business development uh, along the corridor, very close to each other, um, regionally, and then looked at the before and after impacts of um, uh, on, according to sales tax, from Larimer Street, where uh, protected bike lanes were put in, compared to the other corridors where they weren't put in. And um, this is a, a really creative study because it controls for seasonal and other economic impacts. You know, if there was an economy-wide spike in in retail sales in Denver, um, you would see that and you would see it across all four uh, corridors rather than just the, uh, you know, the corridor that you see the bike infrastructure in. And so, uh, you know, this showed that with that corridor, there was an increase in sales. There were a couple of other elements in this study as well. Um, one of them was that the protected bike lanes improved safety for all modes of transportation, pedestrians, uh, folks on bikes, and uh, folks who were driving. Um, and one of the particular elements was that it reduced sidewalk riding in, in a substantial manner. In terms of an event, um, we know that uh, event economic impacts are, are uh, an important area so that, uh, you know, oftentimes there'll be an event like the Sea Otter Classic, which is out in Monterey, where uh, you know the event kind of dominates a, a region or a city for a few days, and there's a number of folks that benefit from that. And but there's also kind of you know, do we want to continue to host these types of events? Um, and these studies can be helpful in understanding you know what is the dollar volume brought in from uh, conducting an event like this. Um, they often rely on tourist, uh, tourist spending and intercept surveys to calculate what, where folks are coming from and how much uh, money they're, they're spending. Um, and this is an example where, this, this particular study is an example of trying to ferret out the impact of the event on the economy had the event not happened. So it doesn't take into account local spending during the event, you know, um, their, their assumption there is that that spending would have occurred for, for another reason at another festival or event. Um, and this methodology has been used not, not only for 
um, you know, running and, and biking and uh, whitewater events, but for all sorts of activities across the country. Uh, we've even done uh, work like this for the, uh, on the entirely other end of the spectrum for the New York Auto Show uh, like a decade ago. So um, this is a pretty well-established methodology. One level up from kind of the segment analysis is a corridor analysis. Uh, and I think that one of the things that's important to understand about these, um, these geographic delineations is that oftentimes a study will look at, uh, you know, start with a corridor, for instance, and then look at particular segments like P, the PH uh, NST T study will. And so it's not necessarily that there's a bright line between all of these geographies. Um, in terms of a water trail, the Huron Water Trail, um, they looked at kind of annual activity uh, for this uh, 100 plus mile water trail um, and in, in Michigan and showed that there was $50 million of annual activity generated by tourism. So again, they were looking at um, you know, what is the proportion of folks that are using this water trail from out of state and how much are they spending? Um, they did use what's called benefits transfer. So they looked at what is a spending profile for typical water uh, trail users and applied that to the estimates of uh, attendance for, um, uh, for this particular trail. And then they also recognized that there was a specific county that had a, a disproportionate share of the impact and they they analyze that in specific. There's a chat. Oh, Debbie, you've, you've been on that trail? Yeah, That's it's awesome. beautiful. It's, a, it's an awesome route. Yeah, there's a lot of really interesting things going on trails-wise in, in Michigan. Um, and uh, they have a lot of potential. Uh, let's see here, next corridor that we looked at. So uh, the Erie Canalway Trail did, a, did an analysis as well. Um, one of the things that I think is, is interesting to look at this study in is that it does kind of the trail user survey and counts, looks at direct, indirect, and induced, those secondary impacts, concentrates on annual sales and the number of jobs. Um, I found it interesting that this study kind of um, leaned into the fact that the typical vacationer and user was, you know, richer than, than, than typical, the, than the rest of the community. So it was kind of advertising the, the fact that like, we're attracting these people that spend a lot of money, which is great. Um, but I think when you're doing a study like this, it's also important to look at the, the flip side in terms of, you know, is that targeting of, you know, tourism, um, is that creating more blind spots to serving a broader resident population? Um, and also, you know, if there are barriers to, uh, you know, participating in outdoor, outdoor activities um, in a particular region, how do you work to, to overcome them? So I think that this was an interesting, interesting study with regard to that. Uh, and this is actually mislabeled. This is a regional, uh, well, national examples of a regional geography. So this is a study that um, I was actually the lead on for our firm. And we worked, um, this was a very, uh, very um, detailed study. The, or we worked with two organizations, two national organizations that were uh, kind of funding this, and they really wanted to make sure that we um, crossed our T's and dotted our I's on everything. We were funded by the, the Walton Family Foundation um, and People for Bikes. And so this study looked at the health benefits, uh, again, in uh, avoided healthcare costs, in, um, in terms of the heat models, um, mortality benefits. Uh, we did a resident survey. Uh, phone-based, uh, phone and uh, email-based resident survey. Um, 
And they were particularly interested in understanding uh, the Walton Family Foundation in Northwest Arkansas has invested a lot of money in um, trail infrastructure. Um, they have invested in the Razorback Greenway, which is a 35 mile paved trail that runs uh, roughly from Fayetteville to Bentonville. And they've also created a number of world-class mountain bike trails in the area. Um, in addition to kind of being interested in doing the um, the work required for a resident survey and understanding those health benefits and, and whether they were getting more participation on biking and, and uh, another study that they did and which was backed up by our study showed that they have more uh, bike participation than like uh, San Francisco Bay Area, their residents are more likely to ride than, than uh, residents in San Francisco, which they thought was an interesting, um, interesting analysis, but they did, um, a hedonic property value analysis where they looked at um we worked with the assessors of uh assessors database and sales records from the counties that they had uh, invested in for the Razorback Greenway in particular and looked at all the sales in the last in the previous six years and um if you take a typical Northwest Arkansas home, um, and you'll notice that we excluded Fayetteville because it has some unique characteristics because it's a college town. Um, but if we took that typical Northwest Arkansas home and we put it a quarter mile from the trail, as opposed to two miles from the trail, there's almost a $15,000 increase in value um, or about 10% in, in value. Um, so that was a pretty interesting finding. And I think that, uh, Given the residents in in Northwest Arkansas, and it was a it was a helpful finding to show that hey, these trails are are beneficial, um, and it's not just sort of uh, it's not going to detract from the folks' property value. Another regional study um, was done by New York City. Uh, about a decade ago, and, and this is a really interesting study where they uh, were looking at some regional impacts, but they chose to do it in by looking at particular segments and investments. Um, they were the first organization that I saw that has done sort of a before and after sales tax view. Okay, we're going to look at a particular corridor. We're going to look at a type of in infrastructure investment, and we're going to look at the sales tax before uh, sales tax receipts before we make that investment and then after we make that investment. Um, they also uh, looked at, um, you know, safety metrics. They looked at uh, how how users perceived the uh, their experience along a particular transportation corridor and, and looked at real estate impacts. Um, this, is, this is a study called Measuring the Street um, and uh, I think it's a really, really well done and interesting study. Again, you know, when you, for those of us that are that are working on these issues across the country, um, the methodology is really helpful. Uh, bringing up that New York saw these sorts of results can be a little bit of a double-edged sword because folks say, well, we're not New York, kind of similar to the way in, in many biking studies that you say, well, this happened in Portland, and I'll say, well, we're not Portland. Um, so, so that's something that's that's interesting to to note when, if you're if you're talking to folks about about benefits. Um, there are a lot of places that have, that have done similar studies that wouldn't be subject to that kind of particular critique. In terms of state or country studies, uh, this is another study that that we did at BBC where we looked at um, the economic impacts of bicycling in Michigan. Uh, we did a resident survey, we looked at uh, the, the heat model, and, and then also they were interested in looking at case studies of particular communities that had unique types of infrastructure investments, like Holland, Michigan, which has a substantial investment in side path trails, or Traverse City, Traverse City in the, in the northern part of the Lower Peninsula, where they've invested in uh, trails that uh, paved trails that can you know, go uh, more into um, kind of rural areas and, and there's actually kind of like a winery tour that's, that's uh, developed around it. 
And then they also had us do a second phase where we looked at the impact of bicycling events. Um, so uh, that's an interesting case for that. And I think that we also provided in that case a uh, example survey that you could use at events. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, I want to uh, I, I want to get up to Traverse City sometime, especially this time of year. I hear it's it's gorgeous. Um, let's see here. I lost my mouse. Another national example um, that I think is is particularly interesting and addresses the uh, equity issues was done by the uh, U.S. Forest Service, and it um, it used the uh, the National Visitor Use and Monitoring data and compared the demographics of visitor use to the demographics of areas near those national forests and looked at um, created an inequity index. Uh, and I think that this is a very, um, very important study. I think it's really well done. And um, I think that it's something that uh, I hope to see more of as it, as as we move forward with this type of research and showing, you know, where the areas where um, we have uh, substantial inequity in um, minority percentage of use of uh, recreation activities and recreational assets. In terms of regional studies, there have been a couple of regional studies that have been done recently. Uh, the first was the Baltimore Greenways Trail Network. Um, they looked at what would it, what would it, how would the region benefit by closing particular gaps? Um, and they had, I believe, four gaps that they were looking at. Um, what are the, you know, those would cost $28 million, result in 10, 10 miles of new trails, and what would be the return on that investment? And so uh, they looked at the, uh, Flow through the economy to uh, workers for trail construction. They looked at uh, how many decreased uh, vehicle miles traveled there would be, um, what the local business activity would be. They also looked at property value, um, public transportation trips, and avoided health costs. Um, and it's a it's a great study, and I think it was done with help from um, Rails to Trails. Uh, In addition, the Capital Trails Coalition just recently, this spring, uh, released a study on a uh, on their trail network. Um, you know, their goals are you know an accessible, equitable, reliable, world class trail system that promotes health and safety. They looked at avoided healthcare costs, uh, construction impacts, local spending, property values, and environmental impacts. Um, and they said, you know, the value, the investment in the in the trail infrastructure thus far is around a billion dollars and that there are around a billion dollars of economic impacts uh, each year. And here's some uh, maps of the trails network that they included. So are there any questions on kind of those national or regional studies? Uh, and then we're gonna dive in a bit to, to kind of how we are thinking about the um, PHNST. All right. So for the Potomac Heritage Tra National Scenic Trail in Northern Virginia, we're gonna be looking at health, social inequity, economic, and transportation benefits. Another unique thing that uh, Debbie and Corey and Ann and Jill's team um, specified in the RP is that they wanna understand uh, what would happen if particular gaps in the trail were closed, because we know that the trail, um, there are a number of gaps, there are a number of places that have been identified as needing additional investment. And so what will that, how will that impact the overall, uh, you know, benefits that the region sees from the trail? You know, in terms of broader goals for the study, I think that the 
uh, you know, NVRC hopes that this will um, further kind of looking at the PHNST in Northern Virginia as kind of a unified trail. There are a lot of jurisdictions that have um, roles in maintaining or promoting the trail. Um, also, you know, identifying what data and, and resources are available, uh, you know, to, to learn about use. One of the things that we're looking at right now is the, the VDOT streetlight data. How is that useful? We know that the, um, the evolution of uh, trail data collection is, is happening kind of in real time. You know, I mean, 10 years ago, most of the data that you relied on was um, folks going out and counting people on the trails. And now there are a lot more techniques and tools that folks can use. Um, I think that out of this study, one of the goals is to encourage organizations to start looking at how we fill those gaps in, in the trail in Northern Virginia, um, establishing this, this baseline of what are the benefits of the trail and how might they grow in the future, and look at some areas for, future, for further exploration where we've already gotten some suggestions from key stakeholders on um, areas that might be uh, ripe for future research. In terms of health, we'll be looking at the value of, of physical activity in terms of uh, avoided healthcare costs and increased life expectancy as well as environmental benefit. Uh, in terms of equity, we're gonna be trying to understand the demographics of trail users, uh, the access points as, as related to the uh, socioeconomic uh, conditions of various neighborhoods along the trail. And then also where injury and crash data, where, where is the trail safest? And is that um, inequitably distributed? In terms of economics, we're gonna be talking with businesses and understanding the potential for tourism impacts uh, for the trail. And then in transportation, we'll be looking at commuting data as well as the demographics of those uh, folks that are using the trail for transportation. And then across all of that, um, you know, we'll have a baseline for the the trail as it is now, and then what we think that might look like if there are some gap closures. Here's a map of the trail and study area. It's in Northern Virginia. Obviously, it's the, the PHNST is, is much bigger than just in Northern Virginia, but we will be concentrating on the Northern Virginia element of it. Um, you know, there's a variety of trail types. So uh, there are water access points, there are uh, dirt trails that are primarily hiking and walking, there are concrete uh, trails that are uh, multimodal, so um, that presents an interesting interesting um, nuance to the this, to this study. We're going to be attempting to look at all modes of trail use, obviously across those jur jurisdictions. Um, in terms of the gap analysis, uh, we are going to look at two gaps and estimate the benefits for closing those gaps. And we have recently uh, worked with Debbie and Corey and Jill and Anne to identify the gaps that we'll be looking at. Um, the first one of those is Neabsco Creek. So that we're going to be looking at the recently constructed segment as well as the additional planned construction of that boardwalk. Um, and we, uh, one of the things that will be particularly interesting about looking at this gap is the connection that it has, that it, the connections that it will increase to local amenities such as the state parks. We'll also be looking in Loudoun County at um, the completion of uh, parts of the trail near Broad Run and Goose Creek. Um, this is, uh, been identified by Loudoun County as planned trail improvements. This will help connect to the WOND trail. Um, and there are elements of the of the gaps that will that go through neighborhoods that are um, you know, considered vulnerable by the CDC social vulnerability index. So it'll be interesting to see uh, what data we are able to bring to bear on how this might improve equity and access along the trail. And I was going to, uh, at this point, um, we are going to, oh, I didn't mean to that one. Uh, I was going to take a minute to see if there are other questions about the study. 
one of the things that we wanted to do is uh, talk a bit about data sources and see if there are any uh, any recommendations from some of the experts on on the uh, training today about um, benefits or drawbacks to particular data sources, those sorts of things. And also, I know Corey, Jill, Debbie, Ann, we have talked about uh, a lot of this stuff, and I may have missed something about either the studies in, uh, more broadly or uh, this study in particular um, that, that you think is important to cover. I just want to mention that I, I watched a video on Strava and I think that their um, data is improving and you know that, that it's become more a little more reliable and more useful especially under certain conditions mm -hmm. and I shared that video with with Jill maybe she shared it with you already but um, there has been quite a quite a few studies done on Strava data so I just wanted to mention that. Oh, that's great to know. And I think I did see that video come through. I'm not sure I've had a chance to look at it, but I know that is, you know, one of the big concerns with Strava and I'm sure something they're trying to address is, um, you know, it, it's a very particular segment of the population that uses Strava. And so uh, working on methods to generalize those data are, can be a challenge. I just had a question, Mrs. Debbie. Um, are you thinking about using Strava or are you going to focus more on like Streetlight and some of the other material uh, resources? I would idea? like to get my hands on the Strava data. Um, I think that, you know, as we, I have the highest hopes right now for the Streetlight data. Like I think that it's probably the, the best, but I would like to get as many kinds of data as we can so we can, you know, use it to cross validate, if you will, and understand, um, you know, where does, where do the different sources give you different results and why might that be? Um, so we're going through the process. I think Jill um, submitted an application to be a government entity that can use Strava and then our team is working on that as well. Um, we have looked at Strava data, we looked at it for a study, um, in Denver, I believe, a while back. Um, so we're familiar with it, but, uh, you know, if we can, as many types of data as we can get. And I know that, I, I think that um, Loudon has it, Loudon Transportation, yep. so, so I'm wondering if maybe um, uh, we can <clears throat> just even use it for one community to, to mm -hmm. do a data check versus the entire mm -hmm. corridor. Yep do some validation. I applied to Strava Metro and they granted me free access for the Shenandoah study that I'm doing. So maybe they would grant free access for this study, I don't know. Yes, this is Jill. Um, we, uh, NVRC got access to Strava recently and Kevin will be able to get access uh, through us. So we do plan to use it for this study. Like uh, Kevin said, we're going to use it to cross-check against against streetlight um, as a as a quality control measure. So, um, you know, this first slide on the data. Just as an uh, as an aside, um, Wolf Trap just installed trail counters. Uh, it's, it's, a number of its trailheads. And I'm trying to interest George Washington Memorial Park, Parkway into um, installing trail counters, particularly um, for the side trails that come in from Arlington County, because we see that uh, that would be a major source of, of traffic. Uh, one of the minor problems we've got right now is uh, we've been reviewing all of the trail signs and many of them need to be replaced. And so we probably shouldn't be installing those counters until after the signs have been replaced because we may also have to replace the posts that would be, would be mounting on them. 
that makes sense. What kind of counters are you using, Alan? Uh, I'd have to look it up. It was an Eagle Scout project, actually, the installation. Oh, <laughs> so that, that played in nicely in that context as well. My uh, nephew just got his Eagle in Roanoke, and his Eagle project was installing bike repair stations along their trail. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so that's, that's, that's great that you were able to collaborate with them. Um, and have you started getting data from those counters? Yes, we have. And um, the Friends of Wolf Trap is actually uh, re reading out the counters um, and collecting the data and entering it on the, the database. Um, uh, there's, a da there's a database associated with it. I don't remember the details on that. If you're interested, I can hunt up the email and send it out. That's great. I might reach out to you about that just to understand, you know, even if, um, and I don't think that there are, there's a few trail counters along um, some of the PH and ST segments that we're looking at, but even having an understanding of what you all are doing so that if somebody in the future, if, uh, you know, George Washington Memorial Parkway or other entities want to invest that they at least consider trying to have um, parallel infrastructure instead of competing infrastructure. One of, one of the issues we've got, um, our prin principal entry is between uh, Teddy Roosevelt Island and Live Oak Drive, uh, although we are also concerned about um, Great Falls Park. But um, We've had an enormous amount of trail damage because of the weather. And so that, for example, there's a major break right there at Pimmett Run. And so if you, if you wanna go, you're gonna to have to wade through Pimmett Run. <laughs> yeah, it's not too inviting. Um, and I'm, you know, one of the things that we've also thought about for this particular study is um, kind of overall visitation data. Um, and uh, Karina, I was curious if uh, with the refuges, you know, how you look at visitor data, what the, you know, drawbacks and, and benefits of sources are, or how you measure that, how you think about that, and if you have any um, thoughts about regional resources related to kind of visitor data. And I can, uh, maybe I'll reach out to you later. Uh, just... I can comment on the state parks. We, we keep uh, attendance data and we have economic impact data and I can forward to Jill to forward to you our 2020 numbers. That'd be one great. Of, one of the great, things that we've you. noticed from COVID is that park, the park uh, attendance is way up and, and Great Falls is, is, is uh, falling over into Riverbend and also into Scott Run Nature Center. And we even see it into the, the Turkey Run uh, area where people are just filling up the place and they're just looking for something else. We just uh, um, are in the process of completing a stairway re renovation between the Turkey Run C1 parking area and the Potomac Heritage Trail. So, which I've been told is the longest staircase in PATC's area of responsibility, which I find astounding. People will get their work out. Well, actually, actually it, was, it was a matter of the, the, the stairs were damaged during the 2011 earthquake and um, they, were, they were actually dangerous. And when you see a father coming down the steps with a kid on his shoulders, this is not something you want to encourage. Uh, hey, Kevin, this is Naomi from Potomac River. Uh, I just wanted to mention, um, we have a lot of, you know, vehicle counters on our refuges. We have a few of those, um, but then we actually just installed an eco counter uh, for tracking bike, bicycles and uh, pedestrians on our new section of the uh, Potomac 
Heritage National Scenic Trail, and that was in partnership with um, Ann from National Parks and um, Prince William County helped install it. So um, I can get you a login uh, for that. And I get, I would like to give NVRC a login um, as well to access that data. Uh, so yeah, if you want to reach out to me, that would be awesome. That'd Thank be you. great. Thank you. What's your experience been? Are you, how are you, What's the data like? Are you happy with it? Are you? <laughs> <laughs> um, you yeah, it? I'm really, I'm really digging the way that they present the data um, on their software. It's like an online software that you can give, um, you know, your different partners logins to, um, so everyone can access it. And then there's these little modules that um, you can basically do your analysis for you, um, and you can, you know, get a glimpse of like all right, you know, what is the analysis of th this past week or this past year, bikes versus peds, weekends versus weekdays, hours of the day, you know, any time in the month, like there's so many options. So it's a, it's a really good platform. I'm, I'm really enjoying it. That's great. And I wonder, we might be able to, you know, if we're creative enough or skilled enough, we might be able to try to verify it or compare it to what we're getting out of uh, streetlights as a, as another data verification exercise. Yeah, that's great. All right. Um, so so as, as we've been talking about, one of the key metrics that we're gonna be trying to figure out is how, how much are people using the trail and what's that volume of use? Um, you know, counters, street light data through uh, Virginia DOT, Strava, visitor data, um, we're gonna, look at all of it and try to try to understand where um, where folks are using the trail uh, and and how they're using the trail um, and if you have recommendations or suggestions or even like Naomi has a login to data that would be great uh, as as we move forward uh, in addition to the trail use data we'll be looking at uh, health data uh, again, that starts with the volume of use. So almost everything uh, relates back to that trail data. Um, we'll be using some uh, healthcare costs, presumably from Virginia Department of Health, although there may be some Northern Virginia specific uh, incidents and cost rates. And then we're still working through kind of which conditions and, and diseases we'll be looking at in specific. Economic and tourism data, we're going to be doing a business survey of trail-facing businesses throughout the corridor. Uh, we're going to look at that from a variety of sources. Anne has already provided um, a list of, kind of interested businesses and outfitters along the trail. Um, we're going to be reaching out to local chambers of commerce and using Hoover's and Dun & Bradstreet um, to try to understand you know, where, are, where are those businesses and, and talk with them and understand what their experiences with the trail where they see challenges. In terms of social and equity analyses, uh, there are a variety of uh, indices and data out there that will help us kind of understand um, what parts of the trail are passing through neighborhoods that are typically underserved. And um, we'll be working closely with Jill and Debbie and Corey to um, kind of figure out the best way to tell that story through data. In addition to looking at the quantitative, you know, are there access points in vulnerable neighborhoods? Are there increased incidents of crashes and, and um, other challenges? We're going to be doing a number of in-depth interviews with uh, um, folks in the area who work with vulnerable populations to understand you know, what are the challenges? How is the trail addressing potential barriers to access? Where are the successes uh, along the corridor? And, you know, are there organizations that NBRC and National Parks and, um, you know, other trail partners should be working with to make sure that uh, the needs of, of all residents are addressed in expansion and use of the trail? Transportation data, we'll be looking at mode share. Obviously, a lot of the transportation data 
um, you know, we'll probably be going back to 2019 and, and looking at 2020 and 2021 with a grain of salt due to the pandemic. Um, but I think that it'll also provide some interesting context about, um, you know, what might be possible or how people responded during the pandemic. Again, we're going to be using streetlight data and VDOT data, as well as uh, information from MWCOG. Uh, in our discussions with uh, stakeholders, one thing that has been suggested is that on the equity um, outreach that we attempt to do a, a non-user survey. Um, you know, we talked among the NBRC staff and uh, there's not necessarily budget for that in this particular effort, but we know that um, some folks from Virginia Department of Health may have some funding that we could direct towards that. So that would be very interesting um, and very useful. Uh, another thing that we've, um, we've kind of identified as a potential step in the future for, for partner organizations is trying to understand like, you know, what does, what does the ideal segment look like? Uh, what's a cross section look like for each area of the trail in Northern Virginia? And how do you make um, a trail that's managed by numerous uh, partners across the region um, cohesive? And we're open to other suggestions. We'll be collecting those as, as we go along. Um, you know, we're kind of at the beginning of this process. We kicked off uh, in the past couple of months. We're uh, aiming to wrap this all up in uh, kind of mid fall, so October ish, October and November. Um, and uh, just excited to hear from from you all and from other folks in the region about. Um, where we should be looking, how we should be looking, you know, how uh, this study can be useful to you and um, how it can potentially help set a, set a baseline standard for um, building off of it in the future and looking at regional investments. So our next steps are gonna be uh, continue to explore those data sources. Uh, sounds like we have some additional ones that'll be coming our way, which is great. Um, you know, we've got uh, the stakeholders meeting, we're, we're finding our methodology based on input from this meeting and a data users meeting that we, we held. Um, we're going to be collecting that health data from the Virginia Department of Health and other uh, Northern Virginia resources, and then identifying in-depth interview candidates. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen in case anybody wants to turn their video on. and. Um, Excited to hear feedback, other questions, uh, thoughts that this has spurred. This is for Jill and, and you. You guys, I just wanted to make sure you all have seen that VDOT counter map that shows the VDOT counts from all across the state, correct? You have access to that link? I think I do. I know I've seen the Arlington one. I'm not sure if I've seen the VDOT one. Um, okay. I'll send it to Jill just to be sure. Um, yeah, we, um, Jennifer, we have seen that. And Kevin, you've seen that. It's the same one that is part of Arlington. Um, oh, okay, great. Arlington's got theirs. Actually, it's not the same one, but Arlington's got theirs. And then VDOT, uh, we have seen that. That is in the, um, the data source list that I provided to you, Kevin. But yeah, we have seen that. It doesn't have anything really along the trail. So the only one along the trail that we found was at the Teddy Roosevelt Island area. And right. So Naomi, getting the access to your trail counters for the Mason Neck area would be wonderful since we only have one other actual trail count um, on the Potomac Heritage Trail. And I believe you can borrow some of those from VDOT if, the, if your trail meets certain VDOT criteria. There's an application on lines. If you want to put any counters up, I'll, I can send you that link to Jeff. That'd be helpful. If we want to put counters up, you say? Yeah, they have VDOT has a borrow program. Oh, well, that's great. But it, you have to meet certain criteria. You know, it's got to be considered a transportation kind of corridor. So it wouldn't work for maybe the hiking sections, but maybe the Mount Vernon Trail or other pieces that. Um, if they haven't got counters already. 
Yeah, if you have information on that program and could send it to us, that would be great. Yeah, I think that that, um, I think that the, the trail counter thing, uh, we were actually, we applied for a grant, remember Ann, a while ago to get a, uh, to get a, some trail counters just for the heritage trail that would tie in with that, but we weren't successful. We should do that again. Yeah, no, I, I mentioned that in the, um, in the chat where, and that would be interesting for, you know, in working with Alan and others where we, so Kevin, what we were, you know, how to get mobile trail counters. Um, but do you remember Debbie, we were gonna have them be at a site for what, three seasons, I guess? To that's for one of the requirements. I think that's yeah. one of the requirements of VDOT is that you have to do it for like three seasons at a time. Uh -huh. Yeah, right, yep. Great. So. Naomi, thanks for clarifying that where your counters are. I, I think that'll be really, really interesting to understand uh, what's going on on uh, the pH and ST near there. Kevin, I'll, I'm gonna also just try to find out um, about any other locations. It looks though like um, Heidi Mitter, who is our contact with Vida, she'll have the best, we'll have to put you in touch with her. She'll have the best um, knowledge of the location of the trail counters as they relate to the NPS sites or any other partner sites. Great. Well, this has been really helpful. It uh, didn't take quite the full two hours, but uh, happy to um, answer any questions about any of the other studies that, that I've talked about. I also reviewed probably, well, I mean, I've reviewed 200 studies over the past 10 years, but probably reviewed 20 or 30 other studies that, for consideration and in, uh, including in this particular presentation, but um, wanted, uh, wanted to see if there's other questions. No other questions. I just, I really appreciate the way you laid out the methodology, Kevin. Um, that, that was really helpful for me to see exactly, you know, like what metrics you were going to use um, and how you would analyze them and how that you, how you would end up with, with an, uh, with, you know, a metric or an indicator or benefit or, you know, something like that. So that was really helpful and I appreciate that. So thank you so much. Well, thanks for all your help in putting this all together. It's, uh, it's a really interesting area, and, um, and, and there's, uh, there's so much that could be done in, in studying these trails. Absolutely. Um, if, if there's anything else, we can, we can close out. If not, um, if there's not, nothing else, we can close it out. I'll, um, I'll, co I'll copy the chat notes and um, send out a, a link to the video um, and Kevin's presentation as soon as we